be we could sit down and um, Derek is going to make sure as soon as everybody sits down that we've got the shot because we've got people in Phoenix and we've got people in the room. This is sort of a half virtual, half live event. And we so appreciate you coming out in this beautiful, beautiful Washington, D.C. weather that we are, are having tonight. Um, and as soon as I get the high sign over there, we will begin. High sign. OK, we're going to begin. Uh, well, thank you so much for, for being here tonight. As I say, I do appreciate everybody making it out in the rain. Uh, welcome to Arizona, State's, Arizona State University's easternmost campus here in Washington, DC. My name is Susan Goldberg. I'm, um, I almost said I'm the editor in chief of National Geographic, but no, that's what I used to do. I am now a, a vice dean and a professor of practice here at Arizona State University. I'm, I'm based here. Uh, so for this Cronkite Live event, which is co-sponsored by the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication and USA Today, we not only have our folks here, but we will be joined by people digitally from across the country, and these will be ASU friends, fans, alumni, and students. So as you might know, ASU is America's largest public university and the most inclusive public university in the country. Our motto is all about that we don't define ourselves by whom we exclude, but by whom we include and how they succeed, which is really um, you know, a charter and a mission that I think we can all get around. I think it's really appropriate that we're holding this event here tonight to learn more about this book called Bad Mexicans by Kelly Lytle Hernandez, and I will introduce her in a moment. But this is an event that is held in honor of National Hispanic Heritage Month. And ASU is designated as a Hispanic serving institution by the US Department of Education. And what that means is that we have on our campus at least 25% students of Hispanic origin. I think our number is actually 26%, and that's a number we're really proud of, but want very much to grow. Um, so tonight's fireside chat will be of great interest to everybody here and everybody who's joining us, but I think it really should be of interest to everybody in the country because we're gonna learn a piece about a piece of hidden history. And this is history that happened you know, at the border uh, in the United States and Mexico at the turn of the last century. And it's history that is still playing out today in how our country operates. So I, and I think it is a fantastic story and we all should know it. So let me introduce the participants of tonight's fireside chat. First, we have Kelly Lytle Hernandez, the author of Bad Mexicans and a professor of history, African-American studies, and urban planning at UCLA today. U no, UCLA. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, UCLA today. That's a new okay, newspaper yeah. school combination. <laughs> and she is going to be interviewed by Romina's, Romina Ruiz Goyriana, who is USA Today's White House editor and previously was a member of Miami Herald's investigative team. So after the two of them talk for about half an hour or so, we're gonna open it to questions, both from our audience digitally and our audience in person. So Kelly and Romina, please join me. Okay. Buenas noches. So thank you so much for having us here. Um, I'm going to start. Um, I absolutely love this book. And I'm going to try and do this and get to the end of the book as quickly as possible, because I think it's the most important part of the book. But can you please, for, the, for those of us who haven't read the book, tell us a little bit about what it's about. Sure. So good evening, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. And I'm really thankful that all of you took the time to come out and to, to learn about this incredible story. So this book, Bad Mexicans, tells the story of a group of Mexican dissidents who were fighting against a dictator in Mexico at the turn of the 20th century. That dictator's name was Porfirio Diaz. And he disparaged the dissidents as malos mexicanos. Translation, bad Mexicans, right? And so it tells the story of after years of incarceration and suppression as journalists in Mexico, they fled Mexico and came to the United States 
to rebuild their social movement. And once they arrive in the United States in 1904, they relaunch their rebel newspaper, Regeneración. They establish a political party called the Partido Liberal Mexicano. And probably most important, they establish an army. That army raids Mexico four times between 1906 and 1908 and helps to create the conditions of the 1910 revolution. Now, when these rebels start all this fomenting of dissent in the borderlands, the Mexican government reaches out to the United States government and says, we need your help to suppress these rebel journalists. Because if they start a revolution here in Mexico, they're going to disrupt all of the US investments in Mexico under this dictator. The Rockefellers, the Guggenheims, and more had bought up all this land in Mexico and, and come to dominate key industries. So the United States government works really, really closely with the Mexican dictator to suppress this revolution that's starting in the borderlands. The US Department of War, US Postal Service, US Marshals, police and sheriff across the country, as well as the very beginning of FBI joined this campaign. So Bad Mexicans tells the story of this rebel movement and its rebirth in the United States and of the cross-border counterinsurgency against them. She's taking all of my questions. Oh, and I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> now, what, what is really interesting to me as a person who covered Central America and Mexico and was a foreign correspondent and also covered immigration was that by cracking open this book, there's a, an interplay of race, class, and power, right? And could you provide for us a little bit of the historical long view? Because all of a sudden, it isn't like we're talking about immigration after the 1986 Naturalization Act. It's no longer a 10-year um, it's not a Bush administration problem. It's not a Clinton administration problem. We're looking at 200 years of history. I mean, after all, the Naturalization Act of 1790 that you talk about in the book restricted the right of obtaining U.S. citizenship to free white men. So can you talk to me a little bit about the borderland and this place of, was it really Mexico? Was it really the United States? And who are these people? Oh, that's such a good question. Okay, so um, let me start by talking about why I wrote this book in, in some ways, that one of the core issues that many of us are battling in the world of US history is that no one knows anything about US Latino history. It's the knowledge is almost zero. And so one of the reasons I wrote this book is that you have this really riveting tale of um, revolutionaries, of um, secret agents of writing in secret code, the birth of the FBI and all that kind of, this really cinematic story that I can use to smuggle into the heart of US history, key issues in Latino history. Those key issues, at least as told in the book, and there are many, many more, is that you can't understand the rise and the impact of US imperialism without understanding Mexican history and the story of Mexican Americans. That's past to present. That's because the, the rise of US imperialism really began in Mexico under Porfirio Diaz. When the United States began its sort of westward expansion, it, it looked up, all those investors looked up and said, where do we go next? They looked south, they found Porfirio Diaz. And so those investments first went south into Mexico and the United States really tinkered with the idea of how do you dominate politics and economy without dominating governance? So that all started in Mexico, Central America. Mexico today. I mean, we can talk about how that history led us to this contemporary moment. But also this really riveting tale about revolutionaries helps us to understand the history of race and racialization of Latino communities in the United States, at least from one perspective. And that's because when these Mexican migrants who begin to come to the United States in the early 20th century, they arrive here, they don't arrive as immigrants per se. We often talk about the United States being a nation of immigrants. They arrive and they run headfirst into a web of white supremacy that Mexicanos in the, in the borderlands had been experiencing really high levels of racial segregation in schools in housing and in jobs. And they also had experienced really high levels of racial violence. And that's why this book opens up with a lynching, right? So this book gives us the history, I think that helps us to have these conversations about what's happening with Latinx communities 
today in terms of race and power and the borderlands and how it all emerges out of that region. And it's this lynching that you call Juan Crow, right? That's the, the backdrop. Um, one of the things that's really interesting that you're bringing up about Porfirio Diaz is that it was because Porfirio Diaz allowed you know, Mexico to be the playground of the Rockefellers, of the Hearst family, of all of these tycoons that we start to see actually as these peasants um, are dispossessed, there's like 25,000 that come over into the United States because they had no, no longer had any land, no longer had any economic oppor opportunities or any claims. Um, how do you think that that is a part of history that has been erased in terms of historical responsibility, in terms of understanding that this is, you know, a longer threat. First of all, what I think is really interesting about what you just asked, I've often thought about the story as being about journalists, right? The dissident journalists in particular. And you just reminded me about the rise of one of the early US media empires, the Hearst clan in particular. They own a million acres in Mexico under Porfirio Diaz. They're extracting a lot of their profit and wealth out of Mexico and turning it into this media empire, which then tells these narratives and stories about why the United States government needs to suppress these rebels. So thank you for lifting that up. I hadn't seen that part of the book before. Um, and then the second part of your question, what was it again? The second part of your question, um, it was about, you know, just how it was actually the role, it was the influence of the United States that triggered the yes. influx of migrants and not the other way around. Yeah, this is really important to understand immigration trends historically, in the sense that we often think about immigrants and their arrival here as an individual's decision or individual family's decision. But what this history really helps us to see is that at least in the 19th century, Mexico was a really pretty rural and sedentary community. People were not migrating far distances. That migration begins with US investors going into Mexico, buying up or being given a large percentage of the land, campesinos being dispossessed of their land, and then the only way for them to make a living is to find wage labor, right? At first, they look for that wage labor in Mexico on these new railroads, in the mines, on the industrial farms that are being built by foreign investors. And then what do they do? They take that railroad north and they come to the United States and they seek jobs north of the border. And they're being invited north of the border to help build up the industries of the growing American West. And so there's a long history of US imperialism creating the conditions and the possibilities and forcing the migration of at least Mexicanos and Central Americans and others into the United States. It's no accident that those migrants, once they're dispossessed, come to the United States. The railroads that were being built create the process for them to arrive on those iron horses. So that's really important for us to think about even today. Why do immigrants arrive? Why do they come to the United States? It's because of those patterns of disruption and imperialism that create the set of possibilities that are available to them. Now, you mentioned that Diaz's cozy relationship with the United States, you know, at one point he's like, no, 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 I need your help. And actually the FBI's first mission is to track down Magón, right? Um, and the U.S. Secret Service got involved. Can you speak a little bit about how this was the first operation? I'd love to. <laughs> Easy. So I'm, actually, I'm a historian of immigration and race and police. Right, and this is one of these stories that helps to bring it all together. Um, so if we think about the FBI, they are understood as being the counterinsurgency super force in US history, from the Red Scare to the Black Power Movement and American Indian Movement to right now Black Lives Matter and others. They are probably the most important police force when it comes to suppressing dissidents in the United States. But no one knows the Mexican or Latino history of the FBI that has been completely erased from the public narrative. So what's really important to understand is as these, these rebels, known as Magonistas, they fall to a, a man named Ricardo Flores Magon, as they're building their social movement north of the border and they begin this army that starts to raid Mexico and make the world wonder if the reign of Porfirio Diaz is really coming to an end pretty soon. The United States gets so worried that they're just starting a new police force. It's called the Bureau of Investigation of the Department of Justice. And initially, they were really supposed to enforce land law across the American West. But after the Magonistas' most significant, most lethal raid on Mexico in June of 1908, 
when this Bureau of Investigation is unfounded on July 1st, 1908, they pivot this new police force. And they say, actually, one of your first new cases is hunting down these Magonistas and all the people who raided Mexico. So the FBI actually cut its teeth on hunting down Magonistas and trying to undercut or suppress the outbreak of the 1910 Mexican Revolution. And nobody knows the story, right? We talk about the FBI and nobody talks about um, Latinos um, as protagonists or as being central to the story of the creation, the formation of the power of that institution. So a big part of this book is putting Latinos at the center of, of US history and the US story. And the FBI is certainly a part of doing that. Now, oh. I mean, in, at that moment in time, it was Mexico that was coming to the United Sa States and saying help. And I can't not think about the undertones that we are living in today. I mean, two weeks ago, migrants were put on planes and dropped off in the middle of Martha's Vineyard. There is a policy by the Biden administration to quote, work this out with Central America and Mexico with these quote, reliable partners even though there are organizations, human rights defenders talking about the increasing autocracy in the region. Um, can you speak to, you know, like what's missing? What are we not, now it's the United States relying, but there's this constant, let's push people out, let's look for people out and there's no real solution. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, I think historically, one thing that's important to understand that the United States has for a very long time, for certainly more than a century, relied upon partners in Mexico and Central America and Brazil in particular to you know, carry the policeman stick, the baton of US imperialism. And that really begins under Porfirio Diaz um, with the Teddy Roosevelt administration that um, Teddy Roosevelt issued what's known as the Roosevelt Corollary. Um, and by that he meant that he wants Mexico, Central America, Latin American countries to help enforce US interests across Latin America. And that's certainly been happening with immigration control over the last 30 years or so with La Mexico and, and all this other stuff. And that is, it's fraying right now. There's a contestation around um, how much Latin America is gonna pick up the big stick of the United States. And I think it's an open question as to how much those migrations are gonna be controlled far away, away from the US-Mexico border. And that's part of the, the tension of these contemporary politics right now. Frankly, I'm happy to see um, Mexico and other countries say that they're not going to aggressively enforce um, US immigration policy, but that doesn't mean they're not doing it. It's just they're not taking up the mantle as much as they were in the, the 70s or 80s. So it's an open question. As a historian, I, I, in the practice of not predicting the future, I'm much more comfortable talking about the past and from the archive in particular. Um, but I think it's a dimension and a theme that we need to consider when we're looking at what's happening in the border is the great grander story of US imperialism. Well, you're definitely in the business of the past. And it, I didn't come up with this adage, but I believe that they say that journalism is a rough draft of history. So kind of pivoting in that direction, uh, one of the most interesting things is that actually these Magonistas were journalists and you kind of flickered at that. Um, can you speak to the role of media on both sides of the border, of the press, both on in Texas, it was like everything that was going on and why it was so important in galvanizing the movement? Yeah, that's a good question. So there was actually a really vibrant Spanish language press across the borderlands, in particular the United States in the early 20th century. And the Magonistas are part of that larger community. What's important about the Magonistas at this time under the rule of Porfirio Diaz is that there were all these vagaries of justice under Porfirio Diaz. Um, he would um, suppress the vote in a variety of ways. He had really pulled all political power into his office. He had also created the um, conditions we talked about before for foreign investors to really dispossess so many um, Mexican um, campesinos and urban workers, and nobody was talking about it, right? You could criticize this local judge or this local mayor or someone else, but nobody could talk about Porfirio Diaz. That was really begging for the regime to come to your front door and either have you arrested or, or worse, right? And what's really important about the Magonistas as journalists is they begin to pull the stories together across the country of Mexico so that people no longer feel that they're 
in an isolated condition. One of the most important conditions that they pulled together was that across Diaz's Mexico, he had empowered um, jefe politicos, these like almost like mayors or small time governors to have a lot of political power locally. And then he said, as long as you deliver the vote for me, I give you everything else. He would tax people merc mercilessly, but also it was a rapacious kind of power. And the jefes would engage in all kinds of sexual violence across the country. Every home, every family had a story, but it was private before the Magonistas came along as journalists began to publish the story from this small town, to publish the story from this small town, to publish the story from this small town. And people began to pull it together that this is a regime of sexual violence. And if we want to change the conditions of our lives, if we want to be safe, we need to take on the man at the top, not just the local head politico, because they're going to be replaced by somebody new with that kind of replacement. And those journalists in Mexico at this time, where Patillo Diaz subsidized a public press, right, and so he controlled the public narrative, they came up with a counter narrative and they were unafraid of challenging the regime in, in many ways that other people were not. And so that I think is what for them was really, really important is they developed a counter narrative to the dictator that said, actually, if we wanna have profound social change in our lives, if we wanna be safe, we need to do more than organize locally, we need to organize nationally. And we need to talk about perhaps removing him from power through the political process, but if that doesn't work, we need to talk about an armed uprising. And that's what they're bringing to the conversation. And their stories, right, as, so, as US investors are coming in, they're dispossessing all those campesinos, where the campesinos go, they go north to the United States, those Spanish speaking migrants, create this new Spanish language press. And so that story begins to circulate on both sides of the border. And some of the people who had the most capacity and freedom to organize were the migrants north of the border. So when the Magonistas as journalists come north of the border, they find a very empowered Spanish speaking Mexican community that is ready to start a revolution back in Mexico. Mexican migrants of the early 20th century weren't really submitting for naturalization in the United States. You know, despite the Naturalization Act of 1790, we can go back and talk about that a little bit more. They really were looking back to Mexico. They wanted to come north for a season, for a year or two years to get their savings together and go back. And so they were willing to fight for certain land and liberty in, in Mexico. And the Magonistas as journalists helped them to pull that together as a story. Now, I want to go back a little bit to that point about organized sexual violence because there's also a really big gender lens. Surprise, surprise, there are women journalists in the story that are Magonistas. And one of the striking parts of the book is really the role of gender. You know, they were anarchists. Um, so many women are featured, like Jovita Idar. Um, and then we have Flores Magón and Sara Estela Ramirez, and the list goes on. How do you think the role of gender played in establishing that counter narrative when the crimes had a gender lens. They were sexual crimes, they were violent crimes. I mean, as somebody who has covered genocide in many, many wars, what ends up happening is that there's always a sexual crime. Wow, that's a tough one. So um, there are so many phenomenal women who are in this book as journalists in particular. Many, most of you are journalists, right, are in the field. Um, and so I hope that everybody knows the names of Jovita Irar, Juana Belen, um, Gutierrez de Mendoza, and others. And we can talk about them in a second. The women were working under incredible limitations and restrictions, right, in, in terms of gender dynamics and politics of their day. And what many of them would do because of the restrictions of them as organizers, the perception that they need to be restricted as organizers is they would chide the men in the public press, right? If I'm here as a woman and I'm telling these stories publicly or I'm on sort of the front line of a picket, where are the dudes at? Like get out here and join us on the picket line, get out here and join us in um, organizing or in the army. So they would do a lot of that work of rallying um, a, a broader community. Um, some of the most important women in this book and some of the, you know, best response we've been getting to the book is around um, this incredible autodidact, probably queer, cross-dressing woman named Juana Belen Gutierrez de Mendoza. Um, 
I want to tell you a little bit about her because you're all journalists and many of you are journalists and I want you to lift up her name, lift up her story as much as possible. So she was from um, Durango, Mexico, and she learned to read very early, largely as an uh, autodidact. And she married a miner very young, uh, a person who worked in the mines, <laughs> very young. Um, and when she was with her husband in the mines, she learned about the conditions of mine workers in Mexico. And she began to write. And she would send in newspaper articles from Northern Mexico into uh, Mexico City to publish the incredible working conditions and the poor wages that miners were experiencing in Northern Mexico. She was arrested numerous times for this. She wasn't supposed to speak publicly about the conditions of work um, outside of the Metropole. And she was so incredible that every time she was arrested after a couple of years on her name and the, on the jail papers, rather than signing her name, she would just write sedition and rebellion. She was so badass. <laughs> so Juana would, um, she eventually sold all of her goats, moved down to Mexico City with her children in tow. And she started an anarchist feminist newspaper called Vesper. And she began hanging out with all these dissident journalists, Ricardo Flores Magón and the others. After they were arrested numerous times, she did time in prison with everybody else. She came north of the border and restarted her rebel newspaper, Vesper. And one of the things that's really interesting about Juana is that the man who's often known as being the leader of the Magonistas, Ricardo Flores Magón, was this charismatic writer. Um, he was bold, he was brave, he would say things against the regime that nobody else would, but he was also acerbic and could turn that tongue of his, which is a weapon against some of his closest friends. And as he began to rise in power, Juana was the person to step to him and say, actually, you know what? This movement is about you. It's about a bunch of principles. And I'm gonna be the one to kind of hold the line against the rise of a new tyrant in many of ways. She and him do battle in ways that I won't discuss here, uh, but it's in, in the book. And she ends up leaving the Maguanistas, goes back to Mexico. And this is important because Ricardo Flores Magón, the journalist, the writer who's bolder than anybody else, never returns to Mexico. He says, everybody grab a gun, everybody go fight. But he never returns to Mexico. Juana did. And she um, helped to lead a, a couple of urban plots against Porfirio Diaz. After he's removed from power, she goes on to join Emiliano Zapata, becomes a colonel in his army, helps to write his Plan de Ayala, which is a big manifesto, and would go on to become an advocate as a writer, as a journalist, for women, for indigenous communities, and for many other folks until she passed in 1942. So Juana Belen Gutierrez Mendoza is this extraordinary journalist of the borderlands that I hope that we can begin to talk about a little bit more after um, this book. Is that the next book? <laughs> um, gosh, that's a good idea. I hadn't thought about that. Maybe. Yeah, that's a good book. That's a good book. Yeah. yeah. Um, what does this tell us, you know, about the role of gender relations in the time of revolution? Well, it, it tells us a lot of things, but I think for me, first and foremost, is there is no revolution without women, period, end of the story. And how it represents itself here in this story is when Ricardo Flores Magón and the other men were being most targeted by the FBI because they're presumed to be the real revolutionaries, right? They're all swept up and they're all put in jail and they're all put in prison. And the two governments, the United States and Mexico, whew, the revolution's over. Ricardo Flores Magón is in jail. We don't need to worry about that revolution anymore. And then the women came. And then the women came. They took their eye off of the women, right? So the women begin, well, they'd always been doing this, but they continue their work and they amplify their work in a variety of ways. One of the ways is that to keep the rebel community together when all these men are in prison, they begin smuggling rebel correspondence across the bars and steel. How do they do that? As they show up at the local jail, in LA in particular, but elsewhere. And they're like, oh, you know, I'm just the wife of so-and-so and I'm here to pick up his dirty laundry. I need to clean his chonies and his clothes and stuff like that. And I'll bring him back some clean ones, right? They pick up those dirty clothes and they would sew into the seams of the pants and the underwear rebel correspondence. And then they drop off the clean clothes and say, I'm just, just clean clothes. Please take this to the, the gentleman inside. And they'd unstitch that rebel correspondence. They'd read it. They'd write a note back and then they'd stitch it back in and send it back out to the jail. So this is how the women kept the communication going among all the rebels. And probably most importantly, um, 
1908, June of 1908, they were able to smuggle the battle plans for the Maguanistas most significant raid in Mexico out of solitary confinement of the LA County Jail this way. So that's one of the ways, I see you back there, right? That's one of the ways that the women kept the revolution going. And there are many, many, many more. Um, so when they take their eye off the women, you take your eye off the revolution and it, through their activity and their actions, um, continue to escalate right up until 1910. They're smuggling guns across the border and baby carriages, right? <laughs> they forgot to look because they didn't suspect the woman. Now you're in a room full of journalists and we are living in a historic moment of anti-media sentiment in the United States. It is deadlier than ever in Mexico to be a journalist. There have been 14 journalists killed. So for the fourth year in a row, it is the deadliest place to practice journalism. And yet people continue. I mean, and, and these murders are happening in small communities. You know, they're not happening necessarily in Mexico City. Yeah. Um, what does this tell us? Like about the Maguanistas, about this legacy, about how we prevail in this job and this profession. So one of the things that I hope for this book about journalists and others is that it provides a history and a legacy for Latino organizers, namely radical organizers or people who are really pushing against um, the status quo, which is the journalists certainly in Mexico. Here in the United States, I was speaking with somebody earlier today about um, the rise of the Latino voter. And everyone's wondering, are they going to be Republican or Democrat? Well, I don't know. They might be Republican, might be Democrat. There's also this third alternative of radicals or anti-capitalist, anti-racist organizers often coming out of the borderlands. And this is the, the shoulders that they stand upon, is the Magonistas. And I want to make sure that they're part of the story. And so you have journalists who might be working a little bit more safely like within the fray. And then you have those who continue to tell the stories that nobody is safe to tell. And the Magonistas are a part of that history. They told the stories that no one was safe to tell and they really did uh, make themselves subject to all kinds of oppression. They were not for the most part killed, but they were um, incarcerated numerous times and their printing presses were shut down. Gag orders were issued against them. I mean, maybe we have something to learn that these journalists weren't killed under this dictator of the early 20th century and journalists are today being killed. So we have to, the teleology of, of history often seems like it's getting better. Maybe it's not, right? And the Magonistas can, can teach us that as well. So in your book or in various conversations, you have referred to the Magonistas as exiles, but I would like to challenge that. Are they, can we, understanding this continuum of the border, really call them Mexican? Can we really call them American? Hmm. Well, that you're trying to give me all kinds of trouble now. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to go down hard saying that they are Mexican. Why? One, because that is where their history and their story has been told and has been preserved over the last hundred years. It has been really eradicated elsewhere. And Mexican scholars, Mexican journalists, Mexican organizers have been the ones to embrace the story together and to make sure that we remember it for today. So in terms of the long arc of that history and who they are and how they're remembered, I'm gonna go down hard saying they are Mexican, right? Who operated in the United States, but they are Mexican. They were by nationality and certainly in terms of the targets um, for the most part of their organizing. So I would not describe them as Americans, even though Ricardo Flores Magón dies here in the United States. He dies in Leavenworth Prison. Um, he was picked up more or less during the Red Scare and sent to Leavenworth Prison, and that's where he passes. Um, but he's ultimately, his body is interred in Mexico City, where it is today. Now, the original Magonistas were all Mexican, but what's really interesting about this movement is that it galvanizes the black community. It galvanizes indigenous communities. And all of a sudden, there's a coalition that joined the Maguanistas. What does that tell us about what is possible um, in terms of an anti-racist rebellion on both sides of the border? Okay, so this might be one of the other reasons why I wrote this book. I have to tell this whole story to be able to get to this story about um, interracial revolution in the borderlands. 
One of the things that we often don't see about the Mexican Revolution is that African Americans are watching it very, very closely from the United States. Why? You have to remember that during the time of slavery, many of us were not looking north for freedom. We were looking south to Mexico. That was our quickest route to emancipation. And there were long and deep ties between Mexico and African Americans coming out of that period. Also, after emancipation, uh, the Mexican government, including Porfirio Diaz, invited African Americans to come down to Mexico and says, you know what? That vice of Jim Crow is getting mighty tight around your neck and your lives in the United States. Why don't you come down to Mexico and we're going to give you more freedom and more land down here? And so there's a pretty tight relationship between the United States, uh, between African Americans and Mexicans. And when the Magonistas begin you know, stirring with this revolution, Black folks are watching really closely because if the Magonistas can throw Porfirio Diaz out of power and create new possibilities for land, like larger possibilities for land ownership and for worker rights south of the border, there was a thought that Black folks would just, just leave just flee the United States and go to Mexico. And so Gerald Horn, a historian at University of Houston and others who've written about sort of the black history of the Mexican revolution. So as the Magonistas are organizing, um, black folks are involved. When Ricardo Flores Magon needs a sanctuary in Los Angeles, he's hiding out trying to avoid the US marshals and this, um, everyone from the US Department of Justice and others. Who does he find a house from? an African-American realtor in Los Angeles. There's no archive as to how that relationship got built, but we also know that when the Magonistas eventually raid and occupy Baja California in 1911, African-Americans are some of the first soldiers who go to Baja California. That doesn't happen out of nowhere. It happens because of the freedom dreams that Black folks have about Mexico. So that's one of the stories <laughs> of Black and Brown solidarity that is forming in this period. And that's why the revolution is so scary to the United States government. Yes, it's about what's happening in Mexico, but it's also about what it means for race north of the border. So I see you nodding at us. Maybe it's time to move on, but I would love if everyone has a question out there to talk a little bit more about these solidarities. Well, we do, we do really wanna take questions, but I'd love to start with our digital audience, if we could, um, some questions from Phoenix. Oh, I see stirring. Okay, excellent. Hi, uh, thanks for this, Kelly. This is super interesting. I'm, I'd be interested to read the book. Uh, this story about um, um, uh, uh, Mendoza, especially, I, I think I'd read it just for that alone. Um, so I with I, I know with, with studying Mexico, there's, a lot of history of lithography and printmaking um, as kind of a way of telling stories uh, and and uh, loosely reporting. Uh, and here at Cronkite, we talk a lot about the power of uh, multimedia storytelling. And it got me thinking, I'd, I'd be interested to know a little more about um, what, uh, you know, what was the content of, of this work that the Magonistas were producing uh, in the United States, and who was it reaching, uh, and and what what was the effect on them? That's a that's a great question. So, um, Regeneración, which was Ricardo Flores Magón's baby, really was these long diatribes. That was his style. He would go on and on and on and on. It's hard to quote from him because the sentences are like a page long, right? And he would just go off on the regime. So, Regeneración was mostly this dense text for the most part. But when that got shut down, they started to publish in this other newspaper called El Abizote. Um, and that was mostly a lot of cartoons and, and political cartoons in particular. So they used that format when that was available. And that's a funny story. When they would shut down El Abizote, they would open up El Hijo del Abizote. And they shut that down and they opened up El Hijo del Hijo. Right? They went on and on and on and on and on. So they kept opening up the child of this newspaper, um, which was mostly satire and political cartoons. But there's also a really important Magonista by the name of Praxidas Guerrero, who's also a name that I hope we all learn. Praxidas was born very wealthy in Mexico, in Guanajuato. And at a young age, he fled his family's home and he came north to the United States and said, I wanted to live like a migrant laborer, like most of the Mexicans. 
And he traveled from lumber yards in Colorado to the docks in San Francisco to the mines in Arizona, where he met up with some of these Maguanistas and he joined with them. And he brings two things that are really important to the revolution. One, he brings a new writing style. And he would um, publish what are known as these tracers or these flashes. They're these really short quips about why revolution is so necessary in Mexico. He would say things like, if you cannot um, walk to revolution, then run, right? It's better to live or to die on your feet than to live on your knees. You know that one for the Mexican revolution? Mm -hmm. That's an anarchist slogan that comes from practices Guerrero to the Mexican Revolution. The Magonistas give the revolution that phrase, but also land and liberty. And Praxis begins to publish this really short pamphlet in the borderlands with these tracers and these quips. And those are really, really important because Ricardo was great, right? And he would do wonderful writing, but nobody could quote him. I can't quote him in the book. Nobody could quote him. People would quote Praxis all the time. So you're talking. And he's the one who really cuts it on the bottom. He also is the one who's going to use words and all this various nonsense. And as he's calling for revolution, he was going to invoke the Mexican revolution. This fascinating. Let's take two more from there and then we'll start here. Go ahead. Hi there. Um, so I was just wondering with American journalists and Latino journalists during this time and the rebellion of these Latino journalists, were American journalists at all like promoting the rebellion or covering at all or working in combination with Latino journalists to promote their cause? Yes, absolutely. And it's it's key. Um, so the Magonistas begin to work really closely with socialist journalists here in the United States. And it's by working with them and publishing in key leftist or progressive journals that they're able to help shift the narrative. That's really important because the United States is protecting Porfirio Diaz. It's one of his greatest strengths of power. If you can gut US support from Porfirio Diaz, all of a sudden he's gonna crumble. So these US and Mexican journalists begin to work together, at least in the popular discourse, to reframe the idea of Porfirio Diaz from being one of the greatest statesmen of the 20th century or the 19th century, to being a tyrant, to being a butcher and whatnot. So that relationship between Mexican and namely Anglo-American journalists is really, really key. And it's happening through the progressive newspapers and the progressive journals um, in the early 20th century. Go ahead. Hi. Um, first, I just want to thank you for your work um, in uplifting uh, Mexican voices um, and Mexican-American voices, and also for your work on your book, Migra, which I uh, found to be really educational. Um, I'm curious from a historian's perspective, what you find to be the biggest um, mistake or misconception that modern day journalists make when reporting on the US-Mexico border. Ooh. We're looking for interns at USA Today. <laughs> I'm not gonna answer that. I'm in a room full of journalists. That was such a setup. That was terrible. But I'm gonna answer in a different way because it's an important question. I'm gonna talk to my historian friends who aren't here, so I'm really safe in that sense. Um, and I'm gonna take it back to Migra because you brought that up. So one of the think Migra is a history of the US Border Patrol um, and really looks at how the Border Patrol came to be focused on policing Mexicans in particular, rather than just focused on anyone who's here without documents. And one of the things that was, I think, a real blind spot for a lot of historians and probably um, journalists as well, is that people didn't want to look south of the border to see the complicity of the Mexican government in the formation of this targeting um, of Mexican migrants in particular. And so one of the major contributions of that book was um, bringing a transnational lens to immigration control and finding the historical ways that the Mexican government had participated and benefited from efforts to build up the US-Mexican border and efforts to control the migration of Mexicans. I'll pause really quickly to explain why. The 1940s, the 1950s, Mexico is undergoing what's known as a Mexican miracle, a great boom of the Mexican economy. 
they didn't want a lot of people migrating out of Mexico and coming to the United States. You needed all those workers there to keep wages down and to work on all these growing farms and whatnot. And so they wanted to see much tighter control of migration. And so they worked really closely with the US Border Patrol. They even established a Mexican Border Patrol to turn back the tide of Mexican migrants who are coming to the United States. And it could be brutal. And there are incidents of the US Border Patrol trying to humiliate Mexican migrants to stop them from crossing the border. They would take them into detention and like shave half of their, their hair, their head, and then send them back to the border and sort of march them along the border to humiliate them. And the Mexican Border Patrol was completely complicit in all of this. So I think that that can be a huge blind spot. I talk a lot about the power of US imperialism and how important it is. It does not mean that there's not complicity happening from other states and governments. Thank you. I'd love to turn to the room for questions. I'll bring around a microphone. I was just wondering if you could walk us a little bit through your journey about how you decided this is this book, not the next book, Romy, and uh, and a little bit about your research. I, I mean, you talked a lot about how um, how what a great resource uh, the historians in Mexico were who have like kept preserved this story. Um, so I assume your Spanish is super great. Your abuela must be so proud of you. <laughs> and um, just if you could walk us a little bit about how you decided this is a story I want to tell, even though it's a story that maybe a lot of Americans, including a lot of Chicanos or Mexican Americans, are not really familiar with it. So um, I've had this story in my heart and in my back pocket for at least two decades. When I first learned about it in graduate school, I was taking a Mexican history course and I read maybe a paragraph or two on the Magonistas. And immediately I was, how do, I, how do we not know more about these? I grew up on the border. No one had ever told me about these extraordinary people who took on both the US and Mexican governments and frankly kind of won, right? And I wanted to have that as a young person if someone had told me that when I was growing up in the borderlands. So it's, all, it's been with me for a very long time, but it's when Donald Trump used that phrase, and I know you know what I'm about to say, bad hombres, that I knew this story had to be told. Why? Because he is playing with a history of anti-Mexican violence. That I knew that this story about the Magonistas would be a really nice package for opening up that history of anti-Mexican racial violence. It's also why I opened the book with a lynching to really ground us in that story, what I think he was really starting to stir up and comparing him right to an autocrat who also wanted to control Mexicans who were trying to fight for a better life for themselves. Today, we have someone calling them as bad hombres. A hundred years ago, we had someone calling them bad Mexicans all the time trying to suppress their, their quest for better lives. So that's part of the reason why I wrote this book. And the archive is extraordinary, right? So Porfirio Diaz has his spies stealing and opening up all of these rebels mail and they would copy down the letters and then they package them up and send them back on their way so that the rebels wouldn't know that they were being followed. And they took all that rebel correspondence and they saved it in an archive in Mexico City. So you have all the rebels' letters, or at least the ones that were caught in an archive in Mexico City that takes you right to the front lines of the revolution. It's also interesting because the rebels did know that they were being followed, right? Black Lives Matter knows they're being followed on Twitter, right? This is no surprise. And see, so we work in a variety of ways to undercut the surveillance. And so the rebels began to write in secret code. They also used pseudonyms. They passed the letters through multiple... Um, uh, intermediaries. And so the archive in Mexico is fascinating. You work in English because they're translating everything for the US agents as well. You work in Spanish, certainly, and you work in secret code and you have to break the secret code. And so there's one letter here written by the Magonistas in secret code. And I give you the translation of the code so that you can break it and find out what's ha happening there. And so K through 12 teachers love that part. Um, and one of my sons and I actually have the tattoo a tattoo of the Magonisa secret code under our arm, and it says Tierra y Libertad, land and liberty. Since I have the microphone, I'm going to take a prerogative and ask a question. Yeah. So we've said several times that this is an unknown history, but why don't we know this history? Why is this so undercover? 
It's a great question because it's very well known in Mexico, right? This is the year that the Mexican government has declared to be the year of Ricardo Flores Magón, right? So the entire government is celebrating this person. Uh, there are streets and parks, and we were talking about this earlier, named after Ricardo Flores Magón and many of the Magonistas. My point here is it's actually a very well told and well known story just south of the border, right? Um, I would say that we don't know this story because we don't know Lati US Latino history, period. We don't know major moments, we don't know major characters, we don't know minor moments or minor characters, and they're part of that omission. We've had a hard time figuring out in terms of the story of, you, of race in the United States, where Latinos fit in that story. So it's kind of hard to figure out where we tell US Latinx history. Um, that's not an excuse, it's a, rash, a rationale or a reason. We don't address US imperialism well at all. When we talk about US national history, we wanna talk about strictly within the boundaries of the United States. But this is a history that I think it shows us that you can't understand the rise of US power without understanding what's happening in Mexico. So I would say, you know, there's a lot of reasons why we don't know the story. We have book bans in Arizona. We now have, you know, the attack on CRT. All of this fits under the umbrella of those histories and those stories. Look what's happening to the 1619 project, right? So I think those are the reasons why. We now have, we're probably in our third generation of Chicano, Chicano and Latino historians with PhDs. So I think there's a maturation of the field that's happening right now. So I hope that we were talking about this earlier, more of those scholars start to write, not just for the academy. You have to write for the academy in those first generations that you're fighting just for your place in the narrative, right, in the institution. I hope more people now are writing for broader audiences. Um, so all these stories, Chicano, Chicano, Latino historians are telling incredible histories in the academy. And we need to start getting those out into the popular discourse more. Well, that's a challenge for all the journalists in the room. So. We have time for one or two more questions. Journalists in the room. Yes, hold on, I'll bring you. To you. This is terrible, I hate public speaking. Um, anyway, so uh, you were talking about the, historically speaking, the Magonistas, you know, they had a perspective, they had a point of view, um, speaking truth to power mm -hmm. and holding people accountable. Um, nowadays, we see that having a point of view in the media is not necessarily a good thing. It's something that is you shouldn't have. You shouldn't have a voice when you're writing news. Do you think the industry, or historically speaking, we have learned to silence ourselves and not have that point of view and not hold people accountable? Uh, <laughs> that's a tough one for the historian. I mean, so <laughs> What I'll say about the Magonistas is that they absolutely were not operating in, in a mainstream media framework, right? And I would say that today that the people certainly have a very strong viewpoint and there's no suppression of that viewpoint. I don't know what's happening in mainstream media. I'm not gonna touch that with a 10 foot pole, to be honest with you. Um, but no one would have presumed that they were anywhere near the center of the story. The, this is the radical left fringe, really. I often compare the Magonistas, their party, the PLM, right, to Black Lives Matter, that there is no desire to really resonate or sort of shape that center. Desire is to change the narrative. And Black Lives Matter has absolutely changed the narrative in this country around race and policing. The PLM and the Magonistas absolutely changed the narrative. We can talk about you know, kind of new media and journalism and who's really doing journalism. I mean, if you look at Twitter, if you look at Instagram, Black Lives Matter is doing journalism in this country. They are reporting on the killings in ways that others aren't. I think that they're very analogous, those two movements. Um, and they've each changed the course of history already at this point. Um, and I hope we don't suppress the story of Black Lives Matter the way that we have done for the PLM for the last hundred years. To that end, I'm working on a new book with Black Lives Matter, actually. <laughs> oh, very good. So you broke some news here. Yeah. Um, all right, we have time for one more question. I mean, you do get things out of the I was hoping to ask if you see a path for local folks to choose their own government uh, so that 
if there's been U.S. meddling in south of the border from Hearst uh, supplying the war, if somebody else can supply the troops or uh, bitter fruit in Guatemala in the 50s up through Salvador and Nicaragua. More recently, it seems like there's been a lot of meddling and a lot of not getting resolved where governments get overthrown and then they just remain a mess to this day. Do you see any hope for locally chosen or domestically chosen governments succeeding in Mexico or anywhere else in Central America? Um, That's a good question. I'm going to flip it a little bit. As a historian of immigration to the United States, the way I heard that question is that in the 19th century and all the way up through you know, World War II, more or less, immigrants had the right to vote in numerous local elections. And that, that right to vote has been stripped away pretty consistently across the country. So there was a time here when everyone who lived and was resident in a local neighborhood could vote on school board and a variety of other local elections. Maybe we could just even look internally about returning power to the residents of a local community to be able to influence local government. And then we can talk about empire and imperialism as well, but all of that's within our grasp and our power right here and right now. Remember, immigrants don't create the immigration crisis, citizens do, by the laws we pass and the priorities that we set. We have criminalized immigration because we chose to criminalize immigration, right? We have built a border because we chose to build, and we could talk a little bit more if you want to about all that. We also can empower immigrants, non-citizens, to participate in governance in different ways. And we've done it before. But as immigration got more Asian and more Latino in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and 90s, those rights got stripped away more and more and more. So I'd invite us to have a conversation just with our own local communities about how we can empower every resident to be an equal participant in the governance of their lives. Well, thank you so much, Kelly and Romina. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And on, and on behalf of USA Today and Arizona State University, thank you all for joining us for this episode of Cronkite Live. Thank you to our digital audience as well. Good night, everybody. I, I think there's time for maybe one more glass of wine and there's, there's books over in the corner. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. On TV. Oh.